Well, good evening. As I walked up here, it was a real pleasant surprise to me to discover that um, within the, the, the pub landscape of Fitzrovia is the Marcus of Granby, less than 100 yards from here. And he features in, a, in, in our tale tonight. So that was a bit of uh, serendipity. I'm going to tell you a, a tale of daring do uh, with lots of British pluck, but actually quite a lot of courage from Johnny Foreigner. Um, including some French dash. Um, sorry about the spelling of Soupçon. Um, but also a sort of proto commando raid, a spy, um, some cock ups. But, but, but this being the new Sheridan Club, I thought you might like uh, some international drinking and just a hint of smut. Uh, <laughs> I'm <laughs> So, my, my name is, is Ewan Carmichael. I retired from the regular army, sadly, eight years ago um, as Director General of the Army Medical Services, which is proof that you can fool all of the people all of the time. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the First World War, but not the one our grandfathers were in. No, no, no. One which their great-grandfathers were in 150 years before. And um, this is a period of of lace walls. And it's about the global uh, First World War. This isn't my slider, I stole it from map porn, but in the Seven Years' War, mid 18th century, basically all the pink bits were where combat took place. So it truly was the First World War. The Battle of Minden was well known by the, by the, the British public but it has become largely forgotten now. It was a great British battle. It's mainly remembered by the regiments which took part in it, which deck their headdress and their colours and the drums with roses. You might want to ask about why the roses afterwards. I became interested in this battle as a schoolboy. I didn't get very many prizes, but the one, of, one of the few prizes I got was this splendidly illustrated book with this inspiring picture of the Battle of, of Minden. I joined the regular army and I was posted to Minden. Um, and for me, that wasn't a, a punishment posting, Northwest Germany. And um, during the first Gulf War, when I took my armored medical squadron to help liberate Kuwait, as you can see, Minden came with me. <laughs> and I, 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 I named my command vehicle Minden Rose. Uh, this will be the sequence. I'll talk about the, the, the Seven Years' War just to give you some context. I'll try and explain why the Brits were involved in Western Europe. Um, I'll talk about the ground. We always love that in, in the military so that you understand where you are. And then I'll do that little commando raid, the French capturing Fortress Minden. Explain the planning. And then we'll divert slightly to a small parallel battle that took place at the same time uh, called Gofeld. And then the meat in the sandwich, Minden and then the aftermath. So this is the period, mid 18th century, cabinet walls, George II, chaps dashing around, wearing these wonderful clothes, pretty impractical, woolen, turn backs with the regimental color, facing color, tricorn hats, and this is a British infantryman with the brown breast musket, which was the, the standard weapon of the British Army for well over a hundred years with one or two minor modifications. It was a muzzle loading weapon, so you had to stand up to load it. Um, it was smooth bore and it had a, a flintlock and it fired these things, which uh, this, this is the true meaning of the word round. We talk about rounds of ammunition, okay? And you would get 12 of these to the pound. I've wrapped it in polythene because it's light and I don't want to, 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 uh, to complain afterwards. Anyway, so if you have a 12-bore shotgun, that explains why you've got that, that calibre of weapon. Um, in addition to the musket, he had a socket bayonet, which would fit on around the, the, the muzzle of the, of the weapon, and it would extend the length of the musket to about that from the floor. Uh, and that so socket bayonet replaced the pike at the turn of the previous century, so you could keep horses at, at, at bay. Other arms and services, we had artillery, just big versions of the musket, 
we had the horse or cavalry, strange regiment of one-legged dwarves here. Um, <laughs> cavalrymen tended to be on, on with a sword, possibly a brace of pistols, perhaps a, a carbine-type rifle. In addition to those, uh, you would have a logistic function or a quartermastering function, certainly a, a, a medical function, and a kind of staff function, so leadership, command, and so pretty early, early staff work. So, thinking about the Seven Years' War uh, as a context, um, more than 250 years ago, the major powers of, of Europe became involved in, in the Seven Years' War, and it lasted formally from 1756 to 1763. But in actual fact, conflict had already broken out in colonies where France and Britain were vying for, for supremacy. Um, the seeds of war are often sown in the outcomes of, of previous conflict. You just need to look at uh, uh, wars around the world and there's usually some that sort of dissatisfaction. And in, in Europe, the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria had built an alliance hoping to regain Silesia from Prussia, which had seized it during the war of the Austrian succession. Britain and Prussia were in alliance with a pile of northern German, usually Protestant little fiefdoms, and they were opposed largely by everybody else. That's France, Austria, Russia, Saxony, uh, Sweden, and eventually Spain. It could be said that the, the Seven Years' War could be divided into two sub-conflicts, those between Britain and France, especially out in the colonies, and then between Frederick the Great and, and everybody else, mainly in Europe. But the two sub-conflicts weren't mutually exclusive. They overlapped, and the battle that I'm going to talk about, Minden, was a, an example of that overlapping. Um, Frederick the Great made a preemptive strike against Maria Theresa by invading Saxony in 1756. And after early success, he was then forced on the defensive by Austria in Silesia, France in Sa Saxony, and, and Russians off to his east. But he recovered the initiative uh, through uh, two significant victories, and then he conducted a largely uh, successful, if exhausting, war on all fronts uh, through until uh, 1761. And he was effectively saved by the death of Tsarina Elizabeth of Russia. Um, he hadn't been very nice to women. He was a terrible misogynist. I don't really like Frederick the Great. He wasn't very nice to Maria Theresa either. Um, anyway, the Prussophile Peter III became Tsar, and that tipped the scales back in Frederick's favour. And the war ended in 1763 with the treaties of Paris and Hubertusburg. Meanwhile, out in the colonies, um, <laughs> France had initially got the upper hand in North America until 1759, the same year as the Battle of Minden, when Wolfe won at Quebec, effectively controlling North America for the English-speaking world. And over in India, uh, the Brits tended to make better headway, seizing Bengal. Now, at the end of the war, Prussia had survived the war, and the map of Europe effectively returned to the status quo antebellum. Overseas in the colonies, effectively, the, the complexion had changed completely because Britain had significantly overtaken France uh, as, as, a, as a colonial power. Thinking about Britain's involvement in Northwest Europe, um, an enduring aim of British pol policy was uh, the liberties of Europe, power politics, putting our weight onto the scales in favour of whoever seemed weakest. At, at the time. And a key figure in Britain's policy at this time was uh, Pitt the Elder. And Pitt the, Pitt the Elder is famous for tending to favour America over European uh, involvement. Uh, but in actual fact, he was pretty pragmatic and he realised that there was, a, there was a balance between the, the two in terms of our national security in, in Europe and then trade uh, being facilitated of overseas. But Pitt was irritated by the, the Georgian royal fixation with Hanover, because George II, as well as being king, was the uh, elector of Hanover. But Pitt was subtle enough to understand there was that relationship of, of interdependence. And looking at Europe, 
Um, I don't know if you can see this terribly well. Uh, this is northwest Germany, so coast up here. This is the River Rhine. Uh, and there's another important river that features now story, which is the River Weser, running down here. Hanover is uh, towards the right of the slide, 60 kilometers to the east of Minden, which is what I'm going to be talking about, with Gofeld, which I mentioned uh, further down here. French advances into Germany in 1757 were sufficient provocation for the elector of Hanover, George II, to declare war, uh, and Pitt agreed to fund the defence of Hanover and effectively northwest Germany. Um, Britain's first foray into Europe wasn't a great success, with the king's son, William Augustus, Duke of Cumberland, in command of a Hanoverian force, but he failed to win a battle called Hastenbeck, which is just there, but we won't refer to it again. And effectively, uh, Westphalia was overrun by the French in 1757. And under the Treaty of Cluster 7, uh, William Augustus was ob obliged to surrender and re he returned home to uh, face his father's anger. Uh, everything seemed bleak with the French effectively overrunning Westphalia and the Austrians even occupying Berlin briefly, until Frederick won a great victory against the Franco-Austrians at a place called Rossbach, and George II, acting this time as King of Great Britain, overturned his son's surrender and re-entered the war. So Cumberland had gone off in, in, in sort of disgrace, and it's time to introduce this chap, who's Prince Ferdinand of Brunswick, who was Frederick the Great of Prussia's brother-in-law, and he was the ideal com uh, candidate to be the commander of the Allied army. And in November 1757, he quickly re-energised that Allied force and mounted a, an aggressive winter campaign. The French overwintering away from home in, 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 in Germany were no fit state to resist him, and their occupation in Westphalia deflated and they withdrew back across the River Rhine. And Ferdinand decided that he, he wanted nothing less than the destruction of his, his French opponents, and he pursued them back across the, the Rhine using pontoon bridges to, to get across at them. And he won a, a fairly tricky battle at a place called Krefeld, but he, he was one of these chaps who could see a great opportunity at getting behind the enemy, but in doing so tended to expose himself to vulnerability in, in his own sort of logistic chain. But it, he, he was a, a, a bit of a genius, but he had overextended himself. So he, he, he sought uh, the home bank, but the, the, the Battle of Krefeld was again a catalyst for, uh, for the British involvement. Uh, and Britain committed more troops onto Europe, and I'll, I'll talk about them in a sec. For, on the French side, the Minister of War directed that there should be two French armies operating against him, which makes, makes it quite difficult. There was an army in the north and an army in the south. Uh, one commanded by a chap to the north called Cantad, the one to the south, a chap called Subiz, um, and they were reinforced by 9,000 Saxons uh, as well. So poor old Ferdinand had got on to the home bank, but he was, he was opposed by two armies and he was heavily outnumbered. His, his force, with the British reinforcements, came to 66,000. And if you want to visualize what 66,000 people look like, Murrayfield at full capacity is, <laughs> he, he, is exactly that. Um, the Brits and, uh, and the Germans married up uh, at a place called Coesfeld, right in the center of the, of the map. And anecdotally, the junior ranks of both nations got on famously well together, singing songs, talking long into the night, although scarcely able to understand each other. That was your international boozing, by the way. <laughs> Speaking of which... <laughs> the, the commander of the British contingent um, succumbed to dysentery and died, and he was replaced by uh, Sackville. And Sackville was one of these chaps he was quite appreciated by his subordinates, uh, but he had the unfortunate habit of rubbing his superiors up uh, the wrong way. In, in March of 1759, Subiz was replaced by a chap called Broy. 
So we've got Contad and, and Broy. And Fort Ferdinand was forced to withdraw all the way to Osnabrück here. And he was faced by these two French armies, and they united at one of his main potential blocking points, Castle, which is down to the south. Um, despite the gravity of the Allied situation, Major Richard Davenport of the British 10th Dragoons was enjoying social distractions. <laughs> and um, he wrote, The dirty village and peasant's barn, which was my lot in winter, is changed to a pleasant country place and a handsome modern house belonging to a chapter of canonesses, all of noble blood. Two of the four that live in the house with me are young and genteel, and one of them is as handsome as an angel. They're perfectly easy and well-bred, without any affectation, speak French, and love English country dances as well as any girls in England. Alas, this very afternoon we were drinking tea and singing French songs. There comes a scoundrel at full gallop, blowing a damned squeaking horn, and produces an order to march tomorrow morning. Adieu, mesdemoiselles, Dachebourg, Deschalier, and Van Galen. Adieu to the loves and graces that hover round the former two, and to the frowsy odour that exhales from every pore of the latter when she sweats in dancing. <laughs> <laughs> That's your spot. The French maintained pressure on Ferdinand, and they identified that Minden, which was a garrison town, had plentiful stocks of rations and ammunition, could be captured. And if they could seize that, they could do two things. They could interpose themselves between Ferdinand and Hanover, which he was meant to be protecting, uh, but also they would seize a key crossing point over the River Weser. And Broy, the Southern Army commander, sent his younger brother ahead with a light force. And uh, here, here is the, the locale of Minden. Uh, as you can see, there's a kind of Vauban-esque fortified town. Uh, running to the uh, east, but flowing northwards, is the River Weser. And running east-west is a significant ridge, the uh, Wiengebirge Ridge, quite, quite highly elevated. And the River Weser flowing through Porta Westfalica, or the, the Minden Gap. Um, the terrain to the south of this ridge is, is nicely undulating. Uh, to the north, it's pretty flat. Um, running past Minden to the south and joining up with the Weser is something called the Bastau Stream. Um, and at its source, because it's flat, uh, a sort of terrible swamp. Um, Go felt that parallel battle that we're going to look at is, is down here. To the northwest of Minden is Minden Heath, and this is where the Battle of Minden tended to take place, with a, a string of small villages uh, round about, and a, a sort of town up here, a, a Petershagen. I said Hanover is 60 kilometres to the east. There was a, a crossing um, protected by the fortress here, a bridge and a ford, um, and the French later, when they captured Minden, put in a couple of um, pontoon bridges as well. And this is the River Weser, quite a significant river, looking quite calm uh, at this point. The town of Minden is hidden behind these trees here, uh, so you can't quite see it. There are two bridges in the view, um, a modern pedestrian bridge, and then this bridge, which was in the old days the main road towards uh, Hanover. And this is the other water obstacle, the Bastau Stream, nicely manicured in, in sort of suburbia nowadays. But in the 18th century, very swampy banks, really quite impassable to an 18th century army. So the French capture uh, Minden, how did they do that? Well, um, basically, Broy's younger brother approached from the south, and in actual fact from, oh, sorry, forgive me, from the east bank, uh, here and he, he was sent with a cavalry force to move quickly but cavalry aren't brilliant at, at capturing fortresses in general terms you know Chapman horse isn't brilliant at climbing walls um, but Broy had these kind of disreputable looking chaps who are French hussars and what they discovered was that uh, there was rumour of a punt somewhere hidden in reeds on the other side of the river 
And, and some bold Frenchman swam the river at night and found this punt. And they were able to ferry 40 men at a time into making a little lodgment under, uh, under the walls in, in the dark. And eventually they got 300 men in a, in a little nest. Um, then at daylight, uh, and this is a kind of architectural model of Minden, uh, with some light guns enfilading, you know, was shooting from the side onto this little hornwork, which was a little fortification at the other end of the bridge. Uh, they were able to subdue the defenders and, and, and rush at the, uh, at the hornwork, and the defenders of that fled. And in, the, uh, in their haste, they left a, a sort of drawbridge open, which gave the opportunity for the 300 blokes lurking in the, in the reeds here to get, get in through the, the main gate into Minden behind them. So the French captured that 1,200 uh, prisoners, and they had a secure crossing now towards Hanover and access to rations and, and, and lots of supplies. So the way to Minden was now o open uh, to them. And the French converged on Minden, and, and effectively Contad's force occupied uh, Minden and, and, and this sort of area here. And Broy uh, brought his army and, and nested it here. So they were protected by the Bastow stream, the Weser, the ridge, and they linked up by throwing in two pontoons. Uh, which meant that the two armies could communicate uh, and, and support each other. So the French seemed to be in a, an impregnable position. <coughs> Contad's overall force now was about 48,000 strong. Um, and Ferdinand had a huge dilemma. He was uh, two days away from... He was in Osnabrück, bear in mind. Uh, he was two days' march away from Nienburg, which was another secure crossing point and a garrison with with supplies, but the French could reach that in, in half the time from Minden. So his option was to head possibly westwards to Munster and be supplied along the River Ems, or he could go east towards Minden, and he opted for the, for the latter. So looking at the preparation and the planning. This is, this is the, the French nestling down in, in this triangle. Um, Ferdinand approached from the north through Petershagen, and in the, in the month before the Battle of Minden, which was on the 1st of August, he drove in French outposts, and he moved down towards this area called Totenhausen, uh, and dropped off this General von Wangenheim and a subordinate corps with about 12,000 men in this area. And then he ordered the rest of his force to march to the, the west, to this area here, leaving von Wangenheim in a slightly exposed position. And that was intended to make von Wangenheim look dislocated from the main body, so possibly a temptation that, that would get the French to come out from behind their, their impregnable fortifications. Ferdinand put his own headquarters in here at a place called Hiller, one of the only reasonable crossings of the Basto, uh, there was a causeway over, over the swampy, swampy marsh. Um, and Ferdinand decided that he would, in fact, I'm going to bin the script now largely, because uh, I think if I stick to it, 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 it will go on too long and be too protein rich. So I'm going to improvise. <laughs> um, basically, Ferdinand decided that he would uh, both threaten and tempt the French out the tempting out was this dislocated force, which the French might be able to defeat in detail. Um, but the, the, the threatening piece was he decided to uh, detach a force to the south to threaten the, the French's communications. Um, this is a view from the main Allied encampment. You can see the Minden Gap, uh, which is that gap in, in the ridge. You can't actually see Minden, it's slightly in dead ground here, but this is the sort of countryside, the sort of terrain uh, we're talking about. Uh, and the forces involved, 76,000, that's Old Trafford, fool. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and the French had about 48,000, so the Parc de France, yeah, outnumbering uh, the Allies. And you can see that um, subordinates, you had Contad 
with the main body and Broy on the other side of the Vesa, but able to communicate uh, with these pontoon bridges. Meanwhile, for the Allies, you had Ferdinand with the main body up at Nordhemmen, and then that poor chap Wangenheim stuck out in his own with about 12,000 men up at that place at, at Totenhausen. Now, there's another chap with the unfortunate coincidental name of uh, Ferdinand, and I'll call him the Erb Prince because he was the uh, senior print, uh, son of the Duke of Brunswick, um, and he was a, a subordinate, and he, he was sent to the south. Uh, and the aim was that he would go down through this gap from Lubecker and come down and threaten the French communications, particularly, bless you, particularly uh, at the crossing of this river here at, at Gofeld. So simultaneous temptation and, and threats. So we'll look at Gofeld. Um, rough parity between the two forces. The, the Air Prince was sent down, and Contad realised he had to do something about that, and he detached a chap called uh, the Duke de Brissac with about the same number of, of, of men to try and secure his communications. And this is the, the Gofeld uh, post bridge. Um, of, of the River Vera, where uh, the, the objective was. Interesting enough, slight bit of smut. There's a brothel, <laughs> there's a brothel in these trees here. The, the, the Jerry's like that sort of thing. Um, so, de Brissac managed to get, get down to Gofeld and, and secure the bridge. Meanwhile, the Elk Prince and his force had come down to this place, Kirchlingen, and on the 1st of August, the day of the Battle of Minden, so simultaneously, the Air Prince attacks uh, de Brissac, and he divided his force into three wings. Uh, General Kelmanzé uh, advanced across the, the, the northern side with the main body to take the, the French on frontally. Meanwhile, the Air Prince went down to the south of the Vera to try and outflank uh, the French. And there was a third group under General von Bock who had a kind of artillery heavy component, and he put in a sort of cut-off group, if you understand that, Bush's cut-off groups are kind of handy things. Um, Kalman's egg uh, at first light came across, first of all, and the French uh, engaged them in something that's now called the Bloody Meadow. But as soon as the Air Prince started to appear down to the, the south, de Brissac ordered his force to move north, and then they ran into the cut-off group and the force dissolved. Uh, with people making their way back up towards Minden at, at best speed. Um, casualties, the Allies took about 300 prisoners of war, captured five cannon, but in subsequent years almost 2,000 skeletons were found on this, this bloody meadow. So we get to the meat and the sandwich, well, belatedly, uh, Minden. So you've got the situation with Ferdinand's main body up here, Lots of pickets out in these little villages. Von Wangenheim's isolated corps. The French securely here um, and, and here, but able to communicate and mutually support each other. Um, I like to think of Minden in five broad phases. I'll come to each in turn. So shaping operations on the Allied right. Ferdinand's uh, big concern was that he, he would move forwards towards Minden and a bit like a quadrant of a circle, as they moved down towards Minden, his force would concentrate, so it would shrink down. Yeah? And he thought that this village here, Hallen, would become his right anchor. So it was very important that that was protected from the French. Uh, from the French point of view, um, the very features that made the French positions here impregnable also made it difficult for the French to break out of. And, and particularly river crossings or, or obstacle crossings are a vulnerable period for any force. If you can catch your opponent sort of mid-stride, um, he, nowadays you'd have to say she as well, he or she is, is vulnerable. So if you can catch them at this point, uh, then that would be re really handy. But his plan really relied on early warning. Time was absolutely critical here. This is the, um, this is the village uh, church in Hallen. It predates the battle, and it's still quite a, a pretty little thing. The, the commanders 
issued their respective plans. But bear with me, I'm just doing a quick sanity check. I may have to run back. Um, no, I'm going to, yeah. Basically, the, the Allied plan was to advance down and, and catch the French as they were on the hop. Um, the French plan was threefold. First of all, a distraction force would go in uh, across that little causeway over the Bastau stream um, and attack at about first light uh, with four battalions of infantry uh, and some, some guns. But Ferdinand had anticipated that and put a battalion of Brunswickers on that crossing with a, with a couple of field guns. The, the, the French main effort was going to be that Broy's Corps would come across the River Weser, across these pontoon bridges at night, and go up through the town and then head north up towards Wangenheim's isolated force up to the north. And at the same time as all of that, Contad's main body would cross the Bastau using improvised wooden bridges, and then the, their engineers made 18 portable wooden bridges, um, and they would put them on the, on the Bastau stream, and the force would cross that during the night. Quite a complex plan, uh, but incredible that they actually managed to carry it out. Ferdinand learned to his horror on, on the night before the battle that two French deserters had been brought in to his headquarters and had revealed all the plans. In addition to that, a spy, the spy of Minden, a chap called Lorman, had actually come into his headquarters and, and explained what the French were going to do. And sadly, two hours passed during the night, the Prince of Anhalt had failed to pass that word to him. And this was in a, a situation where time was absolutely critical. Ferdinand, as soon as he learnt that something was happening, ordered the, the, the army to stand to and advance forwards. And he, he went down towards uh, Harlan, this little village on his right flank to find out what was happening. And he found that the pickets were halted at the next uh, town, um, next little village further on. I've lost a slide here, forgive me. Yeah, he, he learned that the French were getting into Hallen. The lead elements of the Brigade Champagne, how's that for a name of a formation? The Champagne Brigade were, were, were coming into Hallen. And he learned that the Prince of Anhalt, the chap who had effectively let him down, had, had stopped here, stopped short at, at Hartem. So he ordered him in to, to this and then he went off to see what else was happening elsewhere. And he came back and he found that nothing had happened, that the Prince of Anhalt was still halted here. Probably in an interview without coffee, Anhalt was ordered in uh, and they put in a, a counter-attack just in the nick of time and managed to drive the French out. And the French withdrew from Hallen, uh, leaving buildings on fire and, and sort of dead and dying there. Um, Advanced towards Todenhausen on the Allied left. Broy had come over during the night and advanced up through the town and they went up towards a ditch round about here called Walfartsteich, which was a kind of forming up point for their final assault. And just before dawn, about half an hour before dawn, they bounced von Wangenheim's pickets. This is Walfartsteich and then they, 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 they bounced the pickets. The pickets withdrew under heavy fire, but unfortunately for the French, uh, Broy halted at this point, probably because it wasn't quite light, and he was waiting for some troops to come up on his left-hand side to support him. So the French main effort was starting to falter at, at this point. Wangenheim, his opponent, meanwhile, uh, alerted by his sentries withdrawing, came forward to occupy trenches and, and from for the French point of view what appeared to be a major counteract counterattack was coming in uh, and effectively Broy halted so the French plan was starting to unravel and now we start to look at what the Brits were doing and this is uh, the, the engagement between von Sporken who commanded a, a division of the army uh, mainly British infantry a few Hanoverian regiments as well and the French horse. And it, much is made 
of the French having cavalry in the centre. You'll see that these units are uh, blue for French, red for, for the Allies. The French, oh, sorry, forgive me. Um, if you look at ones with a sort of sawtooth pattern, that indicates cavalry. Uh, there's some cavalry up here and also up here. Much is made of the French having cavalry in the centre, which was kind of unconventional thing. I think it happened because this was the French main effort which was going in here, but faltering. Um, anyway, von Spocken's force had got onto the battlefield faster than everybody else, and it had accelerated, and, and just like this clip from Barry Linden, this gives you a fairly reasonable impression of, of what troops going into, into battle would look like. And this is von Spocken's formation. Um, these are British regiments, uh, the Royal Anglians, Fusiliers, people like that, a couple of um, Hanoverian Guards regiments uh, as well. And they marched forward, and at the same time some British light guns started to suppress uh, fire uh, round about Hallen. This is looking towards the Minden Gap, and this road running away from us gives a pretty good approximation of von Spocken's line going here, and they were advancing slightly skewed uh, towards the Minden Gap, towards Minden, uh, but they were following their, their approach road. And basically, as they, as they came past Hallen, they came under fire from about 60 French guns. And I need to quote um, some, some pretty graphic quotes. Basically, the, the, the French artillery started to hit the right flank of Punch Borkin's formation. And the, the 12th and 20th of foot, so Anglians and Royal Fusiliers, suffered the most. Lieutenant Thompson of the 20th foot wrote from hospital afterwards, I saw heads, legs and arms taken off every minute. And Lieutenant Montgomery of the 12th foot described the effect of the fire in a letter written to his mother. Imagine writing this to your mother. At the beginning of the action, I was almost knocked off my legs by my three right-hand men who were killed and drove against me by a cannonball. And then he was a really lucky chap because he described that some time after, I received from a spent wall such a rap on my collarbone as I've had frequently had from that most dreaded weapon, your crooked-headed stick. <laughs> I, got a, I got another of these also on one of my legs, which gave me about as much pain as would a tap from Miss Matthews' fan. Um, he was a genuinely lucky man, um, probably at the extreme range of, of, of musketry at that point. At this point, Contad sent what to Broy to halt his advance here, and it had halted anyway, while Contad's main army dealt with this odd thing developing out here. And Fitzjames, who was in charge of the French cavalry, all this kind of sawtooth stuff here, would, would deal with this kind of bizarre manoeuvre. Maneuver. And the order was given for the, the first 12 squadrons of French cavalry uh, to attack. So that's over a thousand horsemen. And if, you've ever, if ever you've stood on the side of a racetrack um, and felt the ground shake from 12 to 30 horses, if you imagine a thousand horses uh, coming at you. Now, a charge in those days would start at a walk, build to a trot, and really only gallop home uh, just at the, at the last moment. But it would take nerves of steel and complete faith in your comrades beside you to stand and, and face that. So the order was given to the infantry to halt, and the first rank of three would kneel down, and the other two would close up behind with, the, with their muskets, with bayonets fixed. And the order was given to fire at about 40 metres range. So you got a thousand horsemen charging at you and you wait till they're about 40 metres away. Crashed out, bringing down men and, and horses. Um, terrible effect, but still with the capacity to kill if you imagine a tumbling horse uh, rolling towards you. Uh, within the infantry, having shattered that first charge, the order was given to reload. Sergeants would pull men and push them into the front rank, um, and then they, they stepped off again. Um, just for some reason, it was just a very aggressive uh, advance. And Fitzjames ordered his second line to charge, this time uh, more squadrons, almost double, so about 2,000 horse. Uh, 
and despite the obstacles to their front, they still managed to raise a charge. And another volley, second volley, crashed out, bringing down men and horses. But before the French could reorganise, the drums beat out and the lines stepped off again. Now, at this point, um, Spocken's column, the division, became even more vulnerable, this time to French infantry, de Guerchi, down here, who had come forward and started to fire into their flank. And this was a vulnerable moment, but the lead brigade commander, Chapel Waldegrave, could see the risk and he ordered the, the flank um, uh, regiments to refuse a flank, in other words, turn and, and face the French, um, presenting more musket barrels towards the enemy. Uh, and a musketry battle ensued. Um, despite the inaccuracy of the individual weapon, you know, you're shooting at a mass target, so the effect was, was pretty murderous. Uh, but gradually, British musketry prevailed and Guerchi's foot melted away. But rather like the curtains opening in a theatre, they presented an even greater threat. And this was a regiment of enemy grenadiers. And Montgomery calls them as fine and terrible fellows as I ever saw. And he also describes them having rifles. So not a smoothbore weapon, but one with a cut in, in, in the bore, which gave it superior range. So the British had to advance through that to engage and then drove them off. But the, the enemy re, reformed out of range and, and started again. So the 12th and 37th of foot, both from the, the front formation, had to repeat that performance advancing through a sort of killing zone to re-engage. And as an indication of the intensity of this, the 12th foot, nowadays the Royal Angl Anglians, um, shows that a battalion could later muster only four officers and 13 files out of um, what was originally somewhere between 120 and 200 men. So 13 files, that's three men, out, out of 120 or 200 files. K General Kingsley, who was in the second brigade, his horse was fatally wounded in four places and it collapsed on him, trapping him, and he was advanced over twice by Saxon infantrymen. Um, and at this point, the French launched their final reserve, 18 squadrons of the elite gendarme de France. And Ferdinand, at this point, realised that everything was vulnerable and they had, had ordered the, the German centre to come forward. And just as the French were about to crash into this now pretty threadbare line, uh, effectively, the Hanoverian artillery, which was up here, sort of blasted into that, that reserve. And as further French infantrymen were committed from, oh, sorry, forgive me, from, go back, uh, from the, the, this area, these German horse came down from the uh, village of Stemmer. Uh, the Duke of Holstein brought them down and, and, and basically swirling around, just destroyed uh, the French uh, centre. So the Allied line had wavered and held, and the moral effect of having re you know, repelled the French horse left the French vulnerable to rout. Uh, so what happened to the British cavalry that was on the right-hand side under that chap of Sackville, the one I said tended to irritate his, his superiors? Basically, Sackville's force of cavalry was up here, and the intention was that they would join in and turn what was a victory into, into a rout. Uh, it was a mixed force of British, like people like the Blue, Blues of Blues and Royals, and Inniskilling Dragoon Guards and so on, but also some Germans, quite mixed up. And that pub that's 100 yards away, uh, the Marcus of Granby, uh, there was Granby commanding the second line, the Sackville out in front. Sackville, ordered his force forwards at a walk, so it appeared on the battlefield at about the same time uh, as the infantry, and then it halted behind a line of trees. And Ferdinand sent word to Sackville saying that the Allied cavalry was to attack. Sackville seems to have thought that that was just a preparatory order, and they ordered his troops to draw the swords, and they sat. And another rider came and said they were to uh, you know, attack immediately. And Sackville led them off towards the right, which was away from where they really should have been committed. And a third rider came, a British Lieutenant Colonel Fitzroy, 
and he said that the English cavalry have a chance to, to win a, a, a great victory. Unfortunately, this was a mixed force, uh, slightly jumbled up. He said that only the British cavalry were, were to come forward, so that caused confusion. Sackville insisted that the three riders explain themselves and clarify their orders to him. And then, not really understanding what was going on, he rode forward to ask Ferdinand what, what he, he wanted, what his wishes were. And at this point, Ferdinand maintained control, said, my lord, you've missed the chance, but if, if I had a Granby to bring forward the cavalry, everything would have been much, much better. And in the subsequent year, uh, Granby actually had replaced Sackville as, as, the, as the Allied commander. The French, despite the inaction of, of this cavalry wing here, dissolved uh, and withdrew. And Broy's corps provided a, a sort of rear guard, withdrawing down un, under uh, the fortifications of, of, of Minden. The French couldn't withdraw down towards Gofeld, so they crossed the Weser and made their way south and headed back towards Frankfurt uh, and went quiescent. They never threatened Westphalia again for the remainder of the war. For the Allies, uh, they, they still had a thousand live casualties to deal with, so there was plenty to deal with. But the day after the battle, they, they finally moved into Minden and, and occupied that, finding more casualties there. And they, they had a, a service of thanksgiving, and they, um, they had a feu de joie where you fire your muskets and, and your cannon without ball in it, just make a bang like a firework. Uh, and the noise of that was so great that the, the pregnant wife of the sutler of the, the British 12th foot went into labour. And Lieutenant Montgomery reported that the battalion cheered the news, and the baby was imme immediately christened Fernand. Um, so the aftermath, there's a little cemetery, uh, this is a private cemetery um, near a civic one, it's owned by a farming family, and although there are no marked allied graves in there, the farming family believes that there are Brits in the, in the, in the graveyard. 2,000 peasants were pressed into service uh, to, to bury the dead, they were buried in, in mass graves. Forgive me. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, in terms of casualties, a fairly busy slide, but effectively, uh, total casualties about the equivalent of Minden, uh, Wimbledon Centre Court. So, um, <laughs> you know, o over 14,000. 14, the French, something between seven and 12,000 killed, wounded, uh, and, and missing. Uh, the Allies, 2,800, of which uh, Britain. Uh, was mainly 50%. Uh, and so to give you an indication of that, the, the 12th foot here, uh, basically 56% um, were, were casualties, either killed or, or, or wounded. Um, in an order of the day following the battle, the 20th foot was actually taken out of the line. Uh, and I quote that, because of its severe losses, it should cease to do duty a measure to which the regiment refused to submit, resuming at its own request its place in the line. Uh, we might just touch briefly on Sackville, what happened to him. Well, Ferdinand issued uh, an order in which he praised most of his subordinates, but he omitted uh, Sackville's uh, name. Sackville worried that he would be uh, accused of cowardice, and he asked for... Uh, a court martial, uh, and he was um, charged effectively with disobedience in battle, which could have been a capital offence. At the end of a, a six week trial, he was pronounced guilty, and whilst not executed, he was adjudged unfit to serve His Majesty in any capacity whatsoever. And his name was erased from the Privy Council, and his disgrace was published in the order book of every regiment in the British Army, so considerable disgrace. Didn't stop him reappearing uh, in the American uh, War of Independence, if you look for the name Germain. Um, so the act is almost done. There we have it, um, a great victory by um, an Allied force with a notable part played by British infantry 
and, and artillery and still celebrated by the regiments today. And there's a little postscript, final slide, there's an odd little thing that happens every year. Um, a mystery donor sends a, a dozen red roses to the British consulate in Chicago and they arrive accompanied by quality stationery uh, marked in memoriam. And this began in Kansas in the 1950s and then in the 60s changed to Chicago. Um, it stopped for two years, 2001 to 2002, when it is thought that the mystery donor died. Um, but then it resumed, possibly because of money left in a will. And consular staff attempting to discover <laughs> who does this, um, every year are told by the florist that the sender is XT Atkins, so Thomas Atkins, and that the address is 1759 Albion. Uh, I'll gladly take any, any, any questions. Um, I've gone on rather long. Just... Is, is there an other association with the roses and the Battle of Min, uh, Minden, or is it just, just those, that mystery? No, no. Um, basically, the regiments involved, so the, not the cavalry, but the, the infantry regiments and two artillery batteries involved, uh, parade every day and they've given roses which they put in their headdress and they deck their, there's a wreath that goes on the colours of the, of the foot regiments uh, and they put them in the, in, the, in the drums and they have a, a parade usually and a, and a great celebration. It, it is considered to be one of the great battle honours of Britain, but it is forgotten, by the, sadly, by the general public. Why do, why do they use roses? Um, people say that the soldiers picked roses on the way to the battle. I don't believe that. I don't think that at one o'clock in the morning, uh, on a fast approach march to battle, you've got time to put, put roses in your kit. What I think would be happening would be in the, in the immediate surroundings of, of Minden, which is a farming area, uh, maybe with some wild roses in celebration, they, they probably plucked roses and, and put them in their kit. The Ger some German regiments would wear sprigs of oak leaf in their headdress to indicate they were on duty. And there might have been a bit of make international Mickey taking, uh, possibly, but but that's the uh, you know that's the association with the rose. There is a Morris dance group somewhere, I think, in Hampshire, Minden Rose. Um, yeah, and in terms of pubs, there is a pub, but I think it's closed down in the last couple of years uh, in in Portsmouth, Battle of Minden. But plenty of Marcus of Granby pubs. He went on to, to win at the Battle of Warburg the next year. Well, I've got a question. Hmm. When you said Minden Gap, yeah. is it associated with some other historical period? Is that? Uh, well, that gap was really significant in Westphalia. Uh, so it would have been significant through history, 30 years war perhaps, in the 1600s. Uh, I've definitely heard that. Yeah. Well, the Romans left a f marching fort somewhere near Minden, and then uh, the Varus battle, Varus Schlacht, uh, where the legions were destroyed, happened somewhere near Osnabrück. Um, so, so even in Roman times, there was an association with that feature. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, thank you, Jürgen, for a excellent <laughs>